It's all yours. Welcome, everyone, and uh, welcome to the session. Tag here is going to be the moderator. Uh, I'm representing AIT Health alumni here, and a great warm welcome to all the speakers. And I think, Tag, you can take it from there. Warm, a big warm welcome to all of you who are here. Thank you, Krishna. That's great. Uh, I'm really happy to do this. And I, I think it's great that the AIT Health Alumni Network is organizing this kind of event. I think that the main goal of today is for you to meet doctors or people in, in, in medicine that are at the edge of, of what it's being done. So we're going to do some just quick conversation with uh, really important stakeholders, uh, people doing very interesting things. So hopefully in 10 minutes with each of them, we're going to be able to cover uh, some great stuff. So I'm, I'm very happy uh, to be able to introduce you to uh, Dr. Carlos Chiesa. Uh, he's in the, in, in the call already. He's, he's a very interesting individual. So he's he's a surgeon, but that, that doesn't really uh, do a honor to what he does. So he's, he's very involved in research. He is a surgeon that has published a lot, even though he's pretty young. And he is among the doctors that I know, the one that has a better grasp of the inner workings of AI and many technologies, such as developing artificial tissue and so on. So Carlos, could you be kind enough to tell us a little bit about yourself? Hello, Tyke. Thank you so much for your invitation, and thank you so much for for the platform. For the platform, uh, well, it's it's not so nice to speak about you <laughs> because I think it's it's a little bit like okay, but well, I, I'm a head and neck surgeon. I work in clinical research, more related with uh, head and neck cancer, of course, but also here in the in my department we work with. Uh, 3D bioprinting, trying to to make tissues like cartilage, like membranic tym tympanic membranes. Sorry, and also uh, some years ago, I'm I'm start to to work with you, uh, with Alfonso, and and with the guys here from in in the university, uh, work to work uh, on AI and the application on in in maybe in the ENT or in otorhinal laryngology setting. Because it's my field, because it's where I need something new to fill some gaps. Interesting. So, so you see, you see technology as an opportunity to fill fill gaps in your clinical yes. practice. Yeah, I think that is the most important uh, thing nowadays because we are dealing during many years. Okay, the med medicine. Sometimes we talk about our oh, medicines. Uh, the evolution of medicine is so fast, but it's not so fast as the people think. This is something, this is, uh, I don't know, it's very, it's very subjective. I'll, I'll talk about this, but maybe in, in this development, increase his, his, his or, or moving faster in the recent year, because we are able now to manage a, a big amount of data. And what is medicine nowadays is, is it's about, it's all about data, you know? And that's the reason why uh, Did you all lose them or is it just me? No, we're all. Okay. Hopefully he'd be back. He'd be back in a second. So he's, what he was saying is very interesting. And he's very humble. He's very modest. Uh, but he's one of the youngest. Yeah. I'm also publishing. Uh, now you're listening. There you go. Welcome back, Carlos. Sorry. Sorry. Pro technic te technical problems. Technical difficulties, like Paul Gilbert says. And well, having all this big amount of data, because in something like in 2008, at least in Spain, some hospitals start to to collect data using digital software. And now we know that we are able to take all this data and extract some conclusions. But this is not the only way to use it, but maybe it's one of them. Then we have the opportunity nowadays with the, the use of mo mobile phone devices to use some applications. In our case, for example, we have some application that can be really important. Like, the, for example, for, for example, uh, audiometry test. We, we have we, we, we use a, 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 some kind of test to to try to evaluate the audition of patients and using 
some devices also using your mobile phone, you can test it. And that is very important because it's, it's, it's cheap, it's faster, and you have in your pocket like this, like this talk, you know? And then with the development of, of, of high definition cameras, this, I don't know, this horizon stands a lot because everything is about an image. Got it. Yeah, very interesting. And I think the problem with people who are innovating is that there is just so many people doing so many things. So when you think about uh, a technology or an idea or something that you see a gap that you want to fill with technology, how do you, what do you do? Do you research the subject? Yes. Do you meet people who are doing it? What do you do? Oh, first try to make some research to know where, where, is, the, where is the state of the art? Then try to learn a little bit about this. For example, about AI, try to, to learn, for example, some, something about Python, programmation, C, C++. Try to learn something about this, read some books, uh, follow some, some influencers, because this is, this is also in, in medicine, we have influencers, also technological influencers. And I think the most important is understand what are the limitations of this technology. Because understand, when, you, when you are able to understand what is the limit, you are able to think how you can fill the gap. That's the reason why I, I think it's, it's really important to not just be an enthusiastic person or enthusiastic researcher, also to learn going deep and try to understand what is the, the, the workflow of, for example, this technology. And, and, and that for me is the, is the best way to, to at, at least have a, an objective. Got it. No, that's very interesting. So knowing the technology, so you know the limitations, of so course. you know how, how high you can aim and you don't get yes. uh, disappointed if something is of not... Of course, it's try to be realistic. Got it. You need to be realistic about what are the, the real limitations. For example, I remember one time uh, talking with Alfonso about the about work in facial palsy, and I say for me in my in on, on my head say, okay, uh, we can use video, but video have frames. Frames have a lot of information. You need a computational power really high to try to analyze all this information, and maybe this can be worse. For your for your idea, and you need to go for something something simple, and of course, keep simple is always good if you have a good results. Very interesting. It's, it's really it's really uh, quite something to see a doctor uh, talk like an entrepreneur. You know, so you're thinking like first of all, let's do like an uh, an MVP. You know, a prototype. Let's understand the limitations, and that let's see how how you can aim. Is is that more yeah. or less your your approach? Yes, of course. Got because it. needs to be realistic. This is the first, this first step, and and it's important because you need to manage your frustrations. And if you are not able to have some a little, uh, at least a little bit of success, then you start to go down, and that's it's uh, that is not good. <laughs> Got it. Uh, one question that I have to ask as well is: I know this is difficult, but. If you have to think about how would your clinical practice be different in 10 years, I know it's a wide uh, time frame. What would you say is going to be different comparing to how it is today? Well, I don't know if this was or, or this will be the reality in 10 years, but I hope we have a different approach because with AI, we can first improve the way that we, make, we, we care about, we care, we care our patients. Because sometimes we think that the only moment that we need to take care of our patient is when they are in front of us. And that's not the truth. Maybe if we can develop some, 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 some way to stay in touch, not, not us, but at least, uh, uh, a, a program that stay in touch with the patient, trying to understand how every day the, the, the health of the patient works. I think we, 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 we will close this gap 
about the, the patient and doctor's relationships. Then, I think 10 years are enough to introduce bioprinting in the, in the current medical practice. Also, I think for sure, the way that we feel the medical history in the, in the clinic, for sure we, we will change because we need to make this, I don't know, uh, something when you are talking with a patient, it's very difficult to stay to, or, to, or maintain your eyes on the eyes of your patient. And that is very important because it's, 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 it's where the confidence born because you need to, 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 to write it in, in a computer, but this can change, okay? Maybe we can try to, to do this in another way. Maybe our computer can do the work and we just talk with our patients. Interesting. And also we need, we need to, to take a, a, a bigger advantage of our mobile devices because it's the, it's the, it's the year of the mobile, mobile devices. And for sure, with the increasing development of technology, we will have better mobile phones than today, and we will make also better, better stuff. I think it's not, it's not, for example, we have good cameras nowadays, we have really good devices, but the, I think the power of, or the computational power of our devices maybe needs to be a little bit better. But this is not, this is, I think at, at, at the same time, this is not a limitation because we can use the cloud to manage all this big volume of data. And well, I think this is the, I think these are the, 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 the pillars for the change. Interesting. So if, if anyone has questions for Carlos, you can see that he is uh, very polyphasetic. He can talk to you about either bioprinting or the use of the cloud in medicine or even the future of, of medicine? I think, the cloud, I think the cloud the cloud needs to, to come to the medicine because, sorry, I, I, I don't want to, 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 to have problem with any of my colleagues, but in medicine, sometimes we are very close minds and we need, to, and it's not, it's not something that is because you are dealing with many problems every day. And sometimes you need someone to push you and move uh, to push you and move forward for example to 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 understand and apply in your current practice or in your day day to day practice uh, all this kind of technology because there is there is a lot of people doing research and working trying to to make our life better you know and it's the yeah. time I, I don't i don't see questions but we have time for questions so i'm going to ask one myself that i think is is very interesting uh, so something I didn't say about you, but it was quite interesting that you've worked in many places all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been in, in America, you've been in Africa, you've been in Europe. And uh, the way you see it, the way in which the, the speed of innovation happens and the quality of the innovation, where do you say Europe stands comparing to Asia or to Africa or to America? I think there are three three ways nowadays, or three channels. North America, for sure, is in the first place, but they always see the business. Then we have Asia, but I want to talk about just China, for example. They have the power, but they don't, understand about uh, the integrity of the of, of being a human being you know it's very difficult because they don't respect human being integrity and that's a problem and then you have Europe Europe ha have the human potential have brains but we are always thinking on legislation and for sure in Europe we will be able to create the most, uh, maybe the, the most respectful AI in the world, but we need, we need to push our legislature to work faster on this, because if we don't do it, the business or the non-human models 
will take the advantage and then it's very difficult to fight against that. But I think Europe have the, have the privilege to think in human rights. And that's it's, it's a, and I know for, for sure someone said, oh, but in the States now, it's not the same. It's not the same because they, they because the, the health care is different than here. The way that the startup works is different than here. And so, uh, are some uh, structural difference that make this different. Also, you check, uh, so for example, many, many startups start in the, in the States and then move to Canada to, to try to, to make something better, you know? Uh, and, and it's just because they think in you know, human rights, you know? <laughs> or in the in, in or, or or the the main focus. It's not just the money; it's also improve the the, the health curve. Very interesting. Very interesting. So the balance between those three things, you know, the business yeah. side, the integrity of the individual, yeah. and of the, course you need you need you, this is a if 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 you want innovation, you need money. It's a business. Yeah. But that's not mean you can think or focus on on the human and not yeah. just in the business. So this is very interesting because I think it ties neatly with the question that Mayeli Sanchez just uh, posted, which is uh, the advantages of the AI. Yeah, they sound really promising, but she wants to know. So but what's the bad part? What are the risks? How can it go wrong? Why shouldn't we use AI? First, we need to be to being able to analyze all the data. We have some problems. We know that AI is very, it's, it's very good to make, some, to make one task. But we have some problems when we try to use the same algorithm to, do make, to make something different because forget the information and we need to deal with this. It's, it's, okay. it's, a, it's, it's, it's promising, but it's not sometimes the, the current trend. Then, we need to be able to, to manage the data because uh, it's information about our patients. And sometimes this can be used, if you use in a proper way, it's good, but if you don't use in the proper way, can be can be harmful for our patients. And then uh, when we are talking about decisions, decisions about, about life, it's very delicate. It's, it's important to understand that the the objective is not to remove doctors from the clinic is to work together we are not able to memorize to know every every scale every guideline sometimes we need to check on google because google is smarter than us he knows everything you know or pubmed and we need a support and ai it's perfect for this because we can we can put all the information that we need in for example in a friend in ai friend that help us in the clinic in the theater for 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 example looking uh this city scans looking mri looking rx these are i think the, the main topics and also another 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 nice implementation, for example, in and, and it's use is use is is used nowadays, and for example, patient with sleep apnea. You think how, how you can help a patient with sleep apnea? Just using a small device in the room that check the snoring, check the 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 the, the times that the patient stop to to. To, to breathe during the sleep. And this is really easy, but you can use, you can use it and make something good for the patient because you extract some data from his sleep process every night in the house. And it's a disease that potentially can treat your life, you know? Yeah, because got you it. Have a... Yeah, no, in interesting, interesting. I'm afraid we're running out of time, but the way this is meant to be, is this a sneak peek? into the world of Carlos Chiesa. So if any of you have a project out there, have any questions, I'm sure that Carlos will be happy to connect with you uh, on LinkedIn. And maybe hopefully we can do in the future a webinar specifically about your experiences and this kind of, of projects. But now I would like to uh, pass the conversation. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you so much. Thank you.
to our next speaker. He is also a physician. Uh, he's, uh, he's called Alessandro Catanese. Uh, and he's, he's, he's quite out, out of the ordinary because he's very involved in the EIT alumni community himself. So if you are also involved in the, in the EIT community, it would be, he's very approachable, which is very great. And he has a really good understanding of, you know, all of the sides of the stakeholders of, of healthcare. So, Alessandro, would you, you, would you be kind enough to tell us a little bit of yourself, a few words about what you do, where you come from? Hello to everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me to, to this webinar. And well, I'm a radiologist. I work in a public hospital here in Barcelona. Uh, well, um, I'm also involved in the IT alumni community because I was an alumni of the of some courses about artificial intelligence. And yes, uh, my first contact with the new advances in artificial intelligence was some years ago. And um, well, um, I totally agree with uh, Carlos. You no, know, about we have a lot of hypes about new technologies, but we have also to recognize that there are some uh, barriers and limitations because um, sometimes there is a resistance among healthcare professionals, but also uh, among the other stakeholders in the um, health system uh, that don't, don't allow to implement and to push forward uh, new technologies. So mm, there are a lot of barriers. I can speak like a clinician, no? Because I see some of these limitations. Uh, in my opinion, mm, new technologies like artificial intelligence could be, uh, can be a very useful tool, no? Uh, in our daily practice. But um, I've seen that among some colleagues, there is a no acceptance of new technologies. And this is my personal opinion. Uh, one um, of this uh, reluctant attitude is that there is a um, lack of knowledge about the technical basis of new technologies and for example, of artificial intelligence. Some months ago, I did a survey among radiologists in, in Spain and was very surprised to, to see that, for example, the, uh, the, the level of acceptance of artificial intelligence and other new technology was higher in colleagues that have a better knowledge about computer skills. So one of my opinion, the most important uh, barriers to adopting uh, new technology is this lack of knowledge about the basis if we don't know how some technology works, more difficult is to use or to put it into the clinical practice. And this is, in my opinion, the key aspect. Uh, so um, it's a gap Alexandra, that we uh, have to reduce. I have a funny question for you. Maybe you have the answer, but if you, if you were king of medicine and you, would, you wanted to decide a new subject, a new topic, that was always in the medicine faculties or nursery faculties in all uh, healthcare faculties that people should learn in university, what would it be? Yes, I think that, for example, um, I'm speaking now about, for example, uh, studying medicine and biology. We should introduce new topic, new subjects, uh, also in the academic curricula. Maybe a, a doctor should have also training about new technology or how to implement new technology you know, in clinical practice and also to have uh, fundamentals about, for example, artificial intelligence, because this is mm, the future of, the, uh, well, of this uh, field, medicine, biology. So we we don't have to be engineers or uh, informatics, but we need to know uh, also mm, the basic concept to understand how the technology works and also to recognize uh, 
bias that could be present into the te technology and to understand when we can rely on, on it or not. Interesting. We have a question from Octavio Gonzalez, and he was asking, in your opinion, you think that the current regulations, whether it be GDPR or medical devices, are up to speed with the current AI technology? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I think that the, the rules that are present nowadays in Europe uh, were not thought uh, for this context. So it's very difficult to apply new technology with the old rules. Uh, I know that uh, European Commission is working about a new uh, about new rules to approve in the next future. Uh, but um, how Carlo was um, uh, saying before, uh, one of the biggest problem in Europe that we have a lot of regulation of rules, and this could could in some way. Um, limit the, the, the application, the adoption of this technology into clinical practice. So I think that we need a change. Got it. And regarding the change, so I'm going to ask you the same question. Well, regarding your clinical practice, the, the way you work day to day, what's going to be the biggest difference you think in 10 years? I think that um, maybe artificial intelligence will be um, a clinical tool like other. I don't think that artificial intelligence uh, will replace any doctors. I don't think so. Uh, um, artificial intelligence can do very narrow, uh, very narrow um, tasks, but we are not at the stage of a general artificial intelligence that can uh, well, we can do the same thing of a doctor. So I think that would be a very helpful task for a, a very helpful tools for radiology that can also help us to reduce the workload and also to reduce the number of repetitive tasks that we have um, daily. And that are also the most difficult because um, a repetitive task uh, induced to, to do mistakes and error. So um, in some way, uh, this tool can also improve the safety for the patients. Got it. Thank you so much. I think that again, like with Carlos, I think it would be very interesting just to have, because uh, it's, you don't speak like a normal clinician. You, your, your mind is you know, very open to, to many things. And I think that that is very, very refreshing especially you're pretty humble about your own skills, which is not so common. And you know a lot about many things. So I think uh, anyone who's watching, Alessandro is also a very interesting person to, to keep on your radar and, and check out. Thank you so much, Alessandro, for, for joining us. Thank you. Great. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, head the, the mic now to Krishna. He's gonna share with us some very interesting uh, facts and, and knowledge about the EIT specifically, which some of you may not know. So, Krishna, are you there? Yes, hi, Ty. Uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to hear both the speakers uh, discuss their uh, views on uh, technology in medical health field. Uh, so talking about me, I'm representing here EIT Health alumni, uh, who is organizing and hosting this workshop over here today. So who is EIT Health alumni? So I just want to give you a quick look into who we are. Uh, EIT Health Alumni is a community of innovators uh, and uh, by innovators we mean it could be uh, doctors, clinicians, entrepreneurs, uh, researchers, students, uh, everybody, everybody who is interested and part of the healthcare movement, healthcare industry around the world is part of our network and everybody's welcome to join our network and um, in this we have only one uh, one goal that is to advance the healthcare uh, innovation around the world and it's only possible because of people like you um, we are based 
all across Europe currently, and we have different members representing from different locations from Spain, Portugal, Sweden, Ireland, Sweden, uh, Italy, Croatia. Uh, we have members from all across and we have board members who are uh, co-working with the local representat representatives in the respective region to organize webinars such as these uh, in-person in events. Uh, and uh, we bring to you a lot of um, access to new conferences, uh, deals, discounts, tickets, and a lot more. And in our network, one can learn about new courses, as Alessandro was mentioning early about uh, AI courses. Uh, we have a mentorship network where you can mentor others or be a mentee. Uh, you can co-create along with your local group. If you're based in one of the big cities, you can co-create um, for new events. Um, I'm sorry, my screen cannot. Krishna? Yeah. Yep. We kind of lost you. I don't, I don't think you can hear us. Well, I, while he comes okay. back. Yes. No, Krishna, are you there? Yes, uh, Ty, can you hear me? Yeah, we can now. Can you see my screen as well? We can see your screen, yeah. Uh, okay, my screen's turned black. I cannot see anything, uh, but I'll still continue <laughs> the conversation. Uh, uh, yeah, so I was mentioning about the EIT Health Alumni Network. Um, there's a lot of possibilities. There's a lot of uh, opportunities present on our platform. We have currently on 2,500 plus members based from all across the world. Um, and uh, what this gives you as a network a network of people who are connected to healthcare in every part of the world. And you can use this network maybe to find a job or to find a project, to get in touch with uh, other researchers, to collaborate with somebody. The opportunities, the benefits are immense. It is up to you what you choose to do with this network. Uh, and um, lastly, I would like to just give you a sneak peek about uh, information about a new event which is happening in Barcelona, since many of the people here are joining from Barcelona. We have an event happening on the 12th of July, um, and it's an in-person event uh, where we talk about the ins and outs of tech transfer. Uh, so please visit our platform, uh, community.eithealth.eu. Uh, please sign up to our network and check out our events. Um, and uh, we also have one more conference on rare neurological uh, disorders in Belgrade, Serbia in uh, September. And uh, for that, um, it's, a, it's, a brilliant, it's a brilliant new conference. Um, and uh, they also cover your travel costs and accommodation costs as well. So I think it's an opportunity worth checking out. Um, so for more information, please join our platform and uh, I will give you one more last piece of information at the end of this uh, webinar. So thank you all and take the floor is back to you. Thank you, Krishna. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not EIT Health. You know, I, I don't have any uh, reason to sell it to you. Well, it's not a product anyways, but I'm part of the alumni community and I can tell you that I've made good friends. So it's more than networking. And I've solved practical issues, practical questions that I had thanks to the events and the, the community. So definitely recommend it to, to anyone out there. So thanks, Krishna, for, for sharing the information and the opportunity about it. Cool. So now I'm going to introduce uh, a person whom I know very well, maybe too well, uh, that is Alfonso Medela. Uh, he's, he's the only one of the panelists who's not a, who's not a clinician, he's not a, a physician. But he's an expert in medical AI. He has been developing AI projects in medicine through, through his career uh, in, in many fields. And now we're working together in a, in a startup that deploys AI uh, with computer vision specifically for clinical trials and clinical practice. So Alfonso, could you fill the gaps of the things that I misrepresented in my explanation? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Dyke, for the presentation. And also thank you EIT for organizing these uh, amazing uh, webinars. And yeah, actually I'm I'm the the black sheep here maybe. Um, yeah, I'm a physicist, uh, but um, in all my career I've been working uh, alongside the doctors. 
So I've been, let's say, developing AI in the in the field and also learning a lot from the, their actual problems and always trying to find the solutions to make their life as easier as possible. Got it. Yeah, that's very interesting because I think this ties very well with what Carlos was saying, then Alessandro. Do you think that AI is, you know, general intelligence is going to at some point replace doctors? Do you think it's, it's a tool? What's, what's you, as an expert, your opinion on that? Well, actually, in, in many fields, other fields like are more automatic or can be some jobs can be replaced. But when it comes to, to medicine, I mean, the doctors are fundamental in the process. And I think and I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, the doctors will be there always and the AI will, will be a complement for them, you know. So AI will enhance the doctors in those very specific tasks that can do better. So definitely no substituting doctors, only helping them to be much better. So what would you say that, you know, imagine me as a patient, I go to the doctor, right? So what do you think, how is, how is that going to be different in 10 years? Mm -hmm. So first of all, um, when you go to the doctor, the doctor will have a support systems uh, in any field, okay, that will make them better in detecting you or diagnosing you of certain disease. This is very common that there are some uh, misdiagnosis rate in different kinds of uh, pathologies uh, because sometimes it might be more difficult and there is, there is the need of more context or some help. Uh, so the machines will help. So the AI will help to make this diagnosis much better. Um, and then also you mentioned going to the doctor, but you might be already connected to the doctor remotely because many diseases are chronic uh, or sometimes you have something new and you have to wait a lot to go to the doctor. But uh, we are already starting to be connected remotely to the doctors in different hospitals. So you will have the chance to be connected and they will review your cases much faster because the AI will be doing different jobs also like uh, organizing by urgency the cases. So imagine you develop a very uh, aggressive cancer the tool will be able to detect your your cancer, show it to the doctor, and the doctor may and the doctor will put you in a, an appointment as fast as possible. So not only in consultation, also in the remote, uh, you will have remote consultations. Got it? Yeah, that's very interesting. Very interesting. And I was gonna I was gonna ask as well because you're an expert in developing the technology, um, and then you became. Uh, peripherally an expert in the clinical problems you're tackling. But imagine, I know that you focus specifically in computer vision. Mm -hmm. uh, but AI, there's many fields of AI. So if someone wanted to do something regarding natural language process, processing, would you also be the person? How do you see this, this fragmentation of the field? Should it be different uh, technological specialists for different things? How do you see it? Well, actually, the, the AI field is very, very broad. There are many, many different uh, kind of algorithms and, and you can say kind of uh, architectures. And as you mentioned, I'm more specialized in computer vision. But when you enter this, uh, this very broad uh, world, you learn a bit of everything, right? This is like uh, you might be first a doctor and then you, you go and specialize as a dermatologist. Does this mean that you don't know about other field? Well, you will need a bit of training at least to be uh, to have the general knowledge. But then once you um, you move from the field, it's quite easy to adapt if you have uh, you know this uh, this general training. So for us, for me, for example, um, I'm, I I know a lot of, about computer vision because I work on it every day. But it would take if I want to be very specialized, it would take another specialist to be very focused in NLP, for example. But yeah, with sufficient training, I could also be uh, I could also move to that field. So it's kind of uh, tricky depending on your dedication. Yeah, got it. I have I have a comment, uh, but I'm going to turn it into a question by <laughs> Fabiane Bergonce from Brazil. Uh, uh, she's kind of saying that what you said before, it's sort of an augmented reality tool, right? Because it. A doctor, a, a GP or a specialist would use a tool, a support tool, and that would augment sort of their capacity. 
Do you, do you see that way as well? Yeah, exactly. When 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 I refer to enhance the doctor, I, I mean by I mean that you you see the doctor with uh, for example, now they have uh, the MRI tools, right? So they can see better in, inside what is happening. So with AI or support systems, they will have another tool that is next to them, or maybe uh, let's say in a different. You can see that interact with that tool differently, but that tool will be uh, let's say augmenting your capacity of doing different things. So for example, a better diagnosis, so we can reduce that uh, misdiagnosis rate. And this way, um, the, uh, prescribe much better the treatment to the, to the patient and also reduce the, that healing time and cost for the, for the uh, treatment. Nice, we have a very nice question now, uh, but I'm gonna ask you first of all that because also Fabiana said, this is great for the GP. So is it also your experience that this is more valuable for the general practitioner in primary care than the specialist, or how, how do you see it? Well, um, if we talk about diagnosis, I would say uh, yes. Um, and, but then uh, now I will move to another field, but in the diagnosis, of course, because the GP has only in Spain one month of training, for example, so they don't have that much knowledge. So it's very useful to have this complementary tool to make better decisions. And for example, do not refer some unnecessary uh, seborrheic keratosis, for example, which they have uh, too many in the uh, dermatology uh, service. Uh, but when it comes to dermatologists, they're very, very good. And it can always help them. Actually, it is proven that can improve their accuracy, but uh, there are all the things that help them more. Like for example, um, remotely taking care of um, the, the um, let's say the severity of the lesions because once you diagnose you need to know how much of the disease or how severe the disease is and this is very very complex and today if you take different specialists they will give you different answers so one will say it's severe with 10 points and another one will say maybe moderate with the six points so the algorithms can help to uh, gather, to, to reach a consensus and a more objective, uh, let's say, uh, measuring tool. So you can keep track of the evolution of the patient, both in consultation and remotely by taking pictures or also answering some uh, patient reported uh, questionnaires. Got it. Yeah, thanks, Fabiana. Those are really good, really good points. Yeah. We have one more question that I think is, is, uh, is really interesting. So something we've been seeing here today is we're, we've met already two doctors and we have one more doctor yet to meet, Elena Sanchez Largo, but they're not the typical doctor because they're very open to innovation. They want to embrace technology. Uh, so the question is, how do you go about as a, as a technician, let's say as a physicist, how do you go about working alongside clinicians? What is your approach? <laughs> okay. First of all, it's it's very nice because you get to know something completely different to what you do in your daily basis. You know, you're all the time with computers. It's uh, it's very nice, and and the approach is always to to go to them and I, I would say like in life to listen to them, uh, and they will, as it is normal, they're very saturated, so they will tell you problems. I mean, as every individual does, you know. So you will start to listen that they're very. Uh, many problems that are in common between them. So uh, the approach is to go to them, tell them what you do, listen to them, uh, and have a nice conversation and you will reach and you will listen to many problems. Then you put all of that in common and you start working with them. I mean, uh, also very good to, um, let's say, to combine and to get, I mean, all of them, they know each other because there are not many in, a, you know, in a, in a whole, in, in Spain but then you get them to work together too in different uh, projects and very nice things start to happen because uh, when they have different knowledge, they are uh, specialists in different pathologies and they have also different approaches. So it's very nice because you will start to listen to different ways to solve problems and also to different needs. And with that, you start to, I mean, this is the, the daily, my daily work. You have to call them, you, you meet them and you start to, to solve these uh, problems with your team, of course. You also end up always publishing results in journals, right? Which is also something, yeah, yeah, yeah it's exactly. a win-win also. Yeah, exactly. And as everything you're doing, this is a very, um, we can say, challenging field 
because you need to validate a lot of what you're doing because this is a it's medicine here you cannot do anything you know like without a validation so then you get to publish with them so you 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 let's can we say we um, we uh, push the state of the art and we start you know you start making new tools and new uh, to improve the technology with them so finally you also publish in scientific uh, journals got it excellent Alfonso that's enough for you for today but <laughs> as I, I mentioned with the with the rest he's always open in LinkedIn to to connect and if you want to talk about technology he's a very good guy to to do so uh, and I think that we we've saved uh, one of the most important things for last so now uh, I'm going to present uh, Elena Sanchez Largo she she's a specialist she's a dermatologist and she's also not a typical doctor uh, she is she is very involved in innovation and digitalization so she works in a, in a public hospital in in Madrid she focuses especially in psoriasis uh, she knows a lot about treatment but she also know, knows a lot about validation of digital tools and implementation so Elena could you maybe Tell us one or two things about yourself. So sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation, Ty. Um, and uh, good afternoon for all. Um, I want to, to, to explain something. I take some notes during the, the other uh, speaker um, um, uh, speakers. So uh, I want to ask you maybe some question. I, maybe you hate the people that answer questions with another question, but I want to to tell to 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 tell you something. Why we need the digitalizations of the health system? Why we are here together speaking about this? Um, uh, because um, for me, uh, the main problem is why we have just opened our eyes and we have just decided that we need to change our health system. Why we have just decided that we need to change um, the, the things that we, we did in the past and we need to, to improve in digital um, skills. So um, um, over the last year, we we have uh, seen so many uh, technicals. I, I don't know, you can hear me, yeah? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah we can. Yeah, 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 okay. Uh, technical advance uh, that uh, um, we call, we have robots to help in surgeries. We have, uh, like um, Alfonso explained, artificial intelligence that can give us diagnosis. We, can, we have um, um, programs that can analyze big data, no? So uh, it's obviously that we are living in a digital age. It's obviously that we are living in a technological age, but uh, why we need this technology? Why do we need to, to change uh, our, our mind? So my first experience with the, um, this technology with artificial intelligence during the pandemic, and uh, the pandemic situation uh, was a, a very big problem, not only in Spain, in, in, in many countries. And uh, the, the pandemic situation so was that uh, there is a very high fragility in the health system. And we have problems with the health system. So we could detect this problem. And for me, if you ask me, uh, the, the digital transformation is the only way to, to change these problems. So um, I use the, the, these tools during my daily practice uh, for resolve one problem. That um, if you ask a patient uh, what kind of visit they prefer, I sure that they are going to tell you that uh, they prefer to see their doctor in person. No? So, so patients always prefer to speak with the doctor, right? Because they know they're being listened to. Yes, yes. Pe uh, 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 people just really like face-to-face -face visit. And it is uh, understandable. But um, what's happened when, uh, when and where we can do it, this kind of visit when it's not available? So I, I think that this uh, was my experience. The, the pandemic situation, we couldn't. 
uh, give the patients this solution. So we we could um, we must uh, look for another uh, solutions, and uh, this is where uh, artificial intelligence telematic monitoring uh, um, has the, the the solution for for our problems. No, and uh, Ty, you you asked to the others that uh, how we think that is going to be the the visits, not the doctor visits in the future. And I don't know. Mm, I don't know because I think that uh, the question is uh, how we want them to be, because it's going to depend of the in, uh, on the best in, in uh, innovation and in technology. Um, other speaker uh, told um, explain us that uh, one of the problem is that not everyone is uh, according with this situation. No. And uh, the key for uh, to improve the digital transformation is to educate the people, is to educate med, uh, doctors, to educate patients, to educate the government, to uh, educate the, the community, because um, it's the only way that they could understand the benefits of adopting this kind of uh, um, this kind of uh, technology. No not only know uh, which are the limits of the technology, we have to uh, educate about the benefits of this technology. Yeah, and it's really interesting that you started with why, why are we doing this? Yeah. And, and I, I know you, because I've spoken a lot with you, but you, you usually say it's because of the patient. Yeah, because we need to, to look for solutions, no? We are here to look for solutions. Um, there are a lot of the, um, um, a, a lot of things that we can do, and uh, there are a lot of the startups or uh, companies that are um, uh, working in, in give us solutions. And I think that uh, the, the main way, the key is the digital uh, transform. No. Um, Mm, I don't know what you think about this, but um, for me, it's, it's the future. So, depend of the of the the, the degree of uh, uh, speed we uh, um, uh, invest in, in in this technology, the future will be the different. So, um, I don't know how it's going to be in ten years uh, because it depend of this. Yeah, and I, I've heard you say sometimes that for some people, for some hospitals, this is like the future. But in your case, this is already the present, right? You're already using AI tools in your in your clinical practice. Yes, yes, uh, we use this uh, kind of of tools in uh, our daily practice because we try to offer the patients the opportunity to choose between the um, the the classic uh, doctor visit in person and and the possibility to have a, a remote assistance with the new technology. So it's what I say that is not the, the future for me is the present, but I don't know how it's going to be the real future because it's going to depend of the of this technology, you know. Um, and um, this uh, technology, like uh, artificial intelligence, we could see that, uh, for example, in this is pandemic situation, uh, uh, is uh, could be the, the solutions for the health stress. And you know, for example, that uh, maybe in that now here we have a problem with the uh, monkeypox uh, infection, and we could uh, faster. Uh, use this uh, technology for another's uh, uh, another health stress. So it's very important to to open our mind for uh, the use of this technology for educate uh, for this technology. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna sh share with the with the viewers this experience because it's very interesting and maybe you can uh, add more information. But so what what happened is uh, in Hospital de Torrejón where Elena uh, practices medicine. As a dermatologist, they started implementing uh, AI tools, digital tools, even before the pandemic, because they're part of Rivera Salud and they invest in innovation. Then the pandemic came, and at least they already have some mechanisms in place. 
And what happened is that now we have the monkey box, you know, Viruela del Mono. And Elena found, found a patient that was uploading pictures to the, the tool they're using. And she was able to diagnose it uh, with better than the actual test they carried out with their tissue. And tax to that remotely, you were able to, to help the patient even better than, than in person. Was that more or less what happened? Yeah, um, I, um, I I want to to explain something that uh, maybe in this case uh, the the opportunity was to to have the fast uh, um, um, to, to the fast uh, like to monitoring the patients without the need to go to hospital you no know, because it's a, a public uh, problem if the patients go to the hospital to keep the the um, the, um, the the remote assessment. Uh, the, the assessment, so uh, we could do it by remote system. Um, uh, I, I want to say something that Alexandro uh, told during his speaker uh, about the education in the universities. Maybe we are thinking with and with our uh, age now, but the young people they are studying the artificial intelligence, the technology with 10 years. So maybe the problem is now because uh, we, we are uh, in, in another rate, but I think that maybe in 10 years, uh, the visit are going to be different because the, the, the patients, they are going to be different too. So it's the only thing that, uh, it's an only thing that I want to, to explain. Yeah, Elena is also a very interesting person for you to check out. Yeah. She has very interesting ideas about AI. She has concepts. <laughs> yeah, she, she's, she's very interesting. So maybe we can even do one specifically with, with uh, Dr. Elena Sanchez Largo, but you can find her on LinkedIn. She's also on Instagram. So any, uh, any questions you may have, Elena, I'm sure she'll be able to, to connect. So thank you very much, Elena. Thank you, Ty. So I'm going to now uh, head back to Krishna because he, I think he didn't mention something quite important that he left for, for, for now. So Krishna, are you there to join us? He is not. Nope. Well, well then we're quite, quite a, uh, you know, I, I, did, I made a teaser and then I, I'm not going to be able to satisfy your curiosity. But again, you know, uh, Krishna, are you there? Yes. Sorry. Um, I'm here right now. Um, yeah. Thank you uh, once again for everything. I think I had such an, I was listening to uh, all the comments about from different speakers and panelists here. It was so interesting to see here the different opinions, uh, the views and the collective opinions expressed about the general uh, healthcare uh, infrastructure, policies, regulations, AI, and so many things. Uh, and I'm grateful that uh, healthcare of the future is in uh, good hands and good minds like you, and, and you're shaping it. So I'm uh, very positive about that. Uh, speaking about uh, back to the health community, so we would like to, before we finish, as I mentioned earlier, I have something special, something interesting uh, for all of you over here. But before that, what I would like to ask you all is to give a quick feedback about our um, session today. Uh, we asked this feedback and it's very important to us because in order to uh, ensure we bring to you webinars such as these conferences and meetings and uninteresting topics, uh, we need to know what do you want to hear? What do the participants, as a participant, what are the topics that you are interested in? And how can we improve our webinars today? So please use the link in the chat over here. And it just is two minutes uh, to leave us a feedback. And talking about the surprise that I had. So as I mentioned, on July 12th, we have an event coming up in Barcelona, in-person event. Uh, and uh, we are offering a few travel grants. If you are based outside Barcelona, we will pay your travel costs so that you can come and attend this networking event, interact with a brilliant panelists over there, and talk about tech transfer and network with them. Uh, so please go check out our platform, check out this event, and don't forget to leave a feedback. 
thank you very much for joining us. Last few words, once again, Taik, uh, Sarah, Alessandro, uh, Elena, Alfonso, uh, everybody, a big, big thank you from EIT Health alumni. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Please feel thank free you for to organizing it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank the speaker especially. Thank you so much and let's stay connected. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Have a nice day. Thank you all attendees. Uh, we will send you the recording of these sessions very soon uh, in case uh, you would like to watch them again. Um, and uh, wish you all a wonderful evening from wherever you're joining from. Ciao.